Greetings, Emmett here from Reading for Wisdom. The history of the 20th century is the history of ideologies. It was the century of ideologies. Two terrible ideologies in particular. Uh, one of them, obviously, fascism, the other, communism. And both sprang from the same source. I would argue that the 20th century was informed by two things. The leadership model, the model of dictatorship established by Napoleon, and also the ideology, the ideology of totalitarianism, of idealism, created by Marx and some of his uh, predecessor philosophers. All this came together in the 20th century in a heady brew, a terrible brew, and it saw its probably its worst manifestation in many ways in the Soviet Union. And of all the figures of the Soviet Union, one man looms large over it all, and that is, of course, the dictator Joseph Stalin. Some of the terrible, terrible things that happened under Stalin's watch, and before that, and of course afterwards, were to some degree um, documented by historians, by political writers. But it would be fair to say that up until the late 60s, a lot of the um, mechanics and the things that happened behind the scenes in the Soviet Union were not only unknown to the Western public, but largely unknown to the Russian people themselves. Unknown in the sense of the big picture of it all. Um, of course, individual Russians, Caucasians, Ukrainians, Balts, all the various different races that came under the USSR and its satellites knew intimately of the horror and the terror. It's just that they didn't see the whole picture. And that was the case up until 1968. And in 1968, a fabulous, terrible, eye-opening, jaw-dropping work, a great work of scholarship was published. And that was The Great Terror by the British-American writer Robert Conquest. Now this is the 1990 reappraisal, um, a reworked edition. But in 68, when the original edition of The Great Terror came out, it was received uh, with mixed reaction in the West. For some, uh, this was um, a revelation. It was a real eye-opener and um, a truth-teller. It was lifting the lid on a part of Stalinist history, uh, the history of 1934 to 1938, the Great Terror, the era of the Great Purge. But for many in the West, particularly in the liberal left-wing intelligentsia and some of its political circles, this was seen as a bit of propaganda. Propaganda uh, because of Conquest's uh, background. Conquest is uh, a, a right-wing uh, author, uh, no two ways about that. During the Second World War, he served behind uh, what later became the Iron Curtain, and he came to know the communist forces very, very well. Right after the Second World War, he worked uh, in propaganda sections of the initially British uh, intelligence services, and for about 10 years, he worked to spread messages about the evils of the Soviet Union. Um, in fact, what Conquest and a lot of his team in those days were doing was not some cementing lies or telling lies, but actually telling the truth about what was happening. Anyway, after going into academia, um, Conquest spent a lot of time uh, taking the archives, the material that came out of the Khrushchev era's opening up, to examine the record of Stalinism, and he published this book. Uh, again, as I said, uh, for a lot of uh, left-wing intellectuals in the West, they, they denounced this work. Uh, this was simply uh, unbelievable. Um, and what really hurt most, and it's one of the key features in this book, is not just the Stalin as a monster um, message, but really showing how Stalin simply followed and simply implemented in greater depth uh, the blueprint that had been established by Lenin 
And uh, I think this is the whole um, problem that people found with this book is there has been a tendency and I think it would be fair to say that there still is a tendency among intellectuals to say Lenin was a good, he was essentially a decent sort of character and if he had lived a bit longer the revolution would have seen its uh, rightful path and everyone would have been happy and socialism in Russia would have been a great success and of course uh, 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 exported to the rest of the world and the whole of humankind would have flowered and bloomed and everything would have been great in the garden but then along came Stalin and destroyed it all. Uh, well this book really reveals the foundation that uh, Stalin uh, built his uh, evil empire upon and that was one certainly established by Lenin and by the party coterie it's a truly, truly shocking work. Um, it begins by setting the picture from the uh, 1917 October Revolution onwards and how the party, um, initially believing that they would be welcomed with open arms by the workers, by the industrial workers, by the peasantry, first of all saw that the uh, rural folk of Russia didn't want to have a bar of this. So the only way to uh, bring the Soviet dream uh, forward was by crushing the rural folk and also crushing some of the minorities uh, that lay within their territory. And then eventually, and uh, not too long afterwards, the industrial classes showed that they too didn't quite like um, the Communist Party rule and so they were crushed as well. And then very much the party turned on itself. Some of the most shocking bits in this book and, but there's a certain amount of um, schadenfreude, to use that wonderful uh, German term in it, is where you see some of these truly repellent, horrible cast of characters um, uh, that are portrayed in the book. Uh, people who were uh, fellow comrades of Lenin, of Stalin, and how eventually they all come to grief and to see how in 1917 a, a cadre of party members by the end of 1938, they no longer exist. They've all been liquidated. So let's hear Conquest tell us about the uh, opening period uh, that the book is set in, that period where Lenin is uh, just on his deathbed and realizing that things are not going according to plan. The Great Terror of 1936 to 1938 did not come out of the blue. Like any other historical phenomenon, it had its roots in the past. It would no doubt be misleading to argue that it followed inevitably from the nature of Soviet society and of the Communist Party. It was itself a means of enforcing violent change upon that society and that party. But all the same, it could not have been launched except against the extraordinarily idiosyncratic background of Bolshevik rule and its special characteristics, some of them hardly credible to foreign minds, derived from a specific tradition. The dominating ideas of the Stalin period, the evolution of the oppositionists, the very confessions in the great show trials can hardly be followed without considering not so much the whole Soviet past as the development of the party, the consolidation of the dictatorship, the movements of faction, the rise of individuals, and the emergence of extreme economic policies. And as we've already remarked, uh, one of the things that we see in Conquest's book is a terrible cast of character. Let's uh, let Conquest introduce us to some of them. Apart from the true politicians operating the overt machinery of party and state, Stalin began from the 1920s to build up a personal group of agents chosen for their lack of scruple and totally dependent on and devoted to himself. There is a Russian proverb, out of filth you can make a prince, which Trotsky says Stalin was fond of quoting. These men were truly disgusting characters by any standards, a cadre which had abandoned all normal political or even communist standards and which may be regarded as in effect a personal group of hatchet men ready for any violence or falsification at the orders of their leader.
At the same time, the political mechanism, containing comparatively reputable figures, continued to exist and was held to the front, just as Al Capone's rule over Cicero was fronted for by civic officials and employed the usual quota of economic and administrative cadres. The bloodthirsty dwarf, Yezov, he was only five foot tall, joined the party in March 1917. Stalin found him in provincial posts and brought him into the Secretariat. He became a member of the Central Committee in 1927. An old communist remarks, In the whole of my long life, I have never seen a more repellent personality than Yezov's. He was reminded of one of those slum children whose favourite occupation was to tie paraffin-soaked paper to a cat's tail and set fire to it. And this was long before Yezov had shown his full potential. On one view, Yezov was merely a typical apparatchik. If so, the level implied is deplorable. A recent Soviet account speaks of his low moral qualities and sadistic inclinations. Women working in the NKVD were frightened of meeting him even in the corridors. He lacked any trace of conscience or moral principles. And in the case of Yezov, we see um, and we can illustrate um, a little piece of Soviet and Stalinist propaganda at work. So Yezov, a terrible character, um, as we've seen, was um, still a very prominent figure in the Stalinist era through the 1930s. And at the beginning of the Great Terror in 1934, and it must be remarked here at this point that 1934 wasn't just the start of terror. There had already been waves and waves and waves of terror. Uh, in the Ukraine, of course, they still remember the famine, the awful evil famine, uh, man-made famine of the 1920s. But in a large degree, um, most of the terrors that had been inflicted from the 1920s and the early 30s were terrors on ordinary people. What marked 1934 onwards was this was when the terror was brought to the party itself. Yezov, uh, enthusiastically part of that. He killed and uh, had dispatched in awful ways many of his colleagues, but he was to get it himself in the end. He fell foul of Stalin. Now there's a famous photograph that we're going to show you now. So that's a photograph of Molotov and Stalin and Yezov at the White Canal on its opening. The White Canal was a great feat of Soviet engineering and slave labor. And you'll see Yezov smiling away, happy to be in the uh, company of uh, the great Stalin at this auspicious opening. But then a few years later, after Yezov's fall, here's the same photograph that was used throughout Soviet history. So for uh, a good um, 50 years, the photograph used uh, to mark that event showed a Yezov airbrushed out of history. He was liquidated. He no longer existed as a person. And it's only um, really in the Glasnost period that the original of that photograph uh, started coming out. So that's what you got when you ran foul of Comrade Stalin. And uh, one of the things at the heart of the Conquest book is the character, of course, Stalin himself. And, well, what an enigma. In many ways, uh, characters like Hitler. Now, Hitler has almost become a, a cartoon character, dare I say it. And what I mean by that is a very one-dimensional figure um, portrayed as this, this crazy, crazy madman, um, though undoubtedly a communications genius, a political genius uh, of a sort. But he seems quite one-dimensional. Um, and his psychology, I think, has been quite well worked through by folk. Stalin is another matter. He is truly an enigma. Let's hear Conquest talk about this figure. If we have put off any consideration of Stalin's personality until after we have seen him in characteristic action, it is because we can recount what he did and later describe the results of the state he brought into being more easily than we can describe him as an individual. He was not one of those figures whose real intentions were ever openly declared 
or whose real motives can readily be deduced. If Stalin's personal drives were the motive force of the purge, it is also true that his ability to conceal his real nature was the rock on which all resistance to the purge foundered. His opponents could not believe that he would either wish or be able to do what he did. Stalin was now 55. Until the age of 37, he had been not a particularly prominent member of a small revolutionary party whose prospects of coming to power in his lifetime even Lenin had doubted as late as 1916. When the revolution came, Stalin appeared to be outshone by many glittering contemporaries. The time since had been spent in ceaseless political manoeuvre. As a result, he had defeated in turn every rival, and he had now been for five years the undisputed head of state and party. He had lately had his methods put to the severest test in the collectivization campaign, and against all prediction, had won through. This had not proved enough for him. Contrary to all that Marx had thought, we shall find in the Soviet Union of the Stalin epoch a situation in which the economic and social forces were not creating the method of rule. On the contrary, the central factor was ideas in the mind of the ruler impelling him to action very often against the natural trend of such forces. An idealist conception of history was for once correct, for Stalin created a machine capable of taking on the social forces and defeating them, and infused it with his will. Society was reconstructed according to his formulas. It failed to reconstruct him. So Stalin and uh, looms large over over this uh, wonderful work, and um, as you go through the book, the horror, the brutalization, is like in uh, Orwell's 1984, like a jackboot stomping you in the face repeatedly. The horror here is simply frightening. The methods simply frightening, and uh, in many ways. Conquest, I do believe, uh, Conquest who uh, departed us at the age of 98, the ripe old age of 98, uh, only relatively recently. Conquest wrote this book not really so much as a look into the past, but as a warning for the future. Because what we see here in the methods described, the ones that Conquest really uh, clearly shows that go back to Marx himself and to some of Marx's fellow travellers like Engels, and these thoughts are still alive and still with us. The methods that the communists used, the methods that Stalin perfected, are still being used by uh, lesser mortals than uh, Stalin um, to really try and push, push, push this totalitarian uh, vision ahead. So this is a lesson for the current. This is a lesson for the future. I am not about, uh, and I certainly do not believe in compulsion in education, but if there is one era I think that should almost be compulsory for all um, school children and adults too, it is the communist era. And I think, yes, studying the totalitarian of Nazi Germany is important. It's covered a lot, I know, in school curriculums, but more important for me is the history of the Soviet Union the monstrous history there. And uh, Conquest, uh, his 1968 edition was uh, in the Glasnost era and when all of the material from Soviet archives started coming out under Gorbachev and then later Yeltsin, Conquest was proven right. He showed that in effect uh, what really happened was even worse than he had initially described. This is an important book. It's a book for all time by a great uh, writer and uh, a writer with uh, such a, a rich, uh, wonderful, enigmatic uh, history himself required reading. So in a future video, we'll be looking at some essential readings on uh, Soviet Union uh, by some of uh, Robert Conquest's uh, fellow researchers and writers. I uh, do look forward to that uh, coming up. Hope you like the new format of reading for wisdom. If you do, certainly 
please do give us a like on this video, subscribe and come along to readingforwisdom.com where we've got lots more to share with you. See you next time. Thank you.